Today, you're all here at this TEDx to witness positive change. And what we hope is that you'll go out into your communities and take them from where they are now to some sort of vision that you may have of where they could go in the future. And story is an incredibly powerful vehicle to get you there. People will adopt your vision, but first, they must feel connected to your, you, your organization, or your cause. And my recommendation is to use the power of story to connect with that audience. Now let me be clear, when I use the term story, I'm not just referring to oral storytelling. I'm referring to using story in your marketing, your recruiting, and any sort of communication that you have with your audience, those that you want to follow your vision. So here's where we're gonna go today. Just like Gandhi, who modeled the behavior that he sought, I too am gonna to model behavior that I hope you all consider adopting. So I'm gonna tell you a story, my story. And then we're gonna break that story down in the second half of the program, and we're gonna take a look at how does story connect. So my story is titled, I Haven't Always Been David LaCours. And it begins on August 13th of 1968, when the stork decided to make a nice delivery right here in San Diego at Sharp Hospital. Anybody else born there? All right. And at 535, Dave and William Heap, that was me, was born. Present at the time was my mom, duh, and her mom. Now, my father didn't learn about my birth until he re received a uh, telegram. But I have unique insight into exactly, you see, because at the time, my father was a Navy fighter pilot stationed aboard the USS Constellation off the coast of Vietnam. And I have some unique insight into exactly how he felt about my birth because I have a letter that he wrote to me, or to his parents, and I'm just gonna read a couple lines for you. And it says, Dear Mom and Dad, I'm sitting in the cockpit, it's 95 degrees, and there's sweat dripping onto this letter. Oops. I'm writing to tell you how great it is to be a father. I'm thrilled about having a boy, but wouldn't mind too much if the next one is a girl. Now that I have a son of my own, I can appreciate a little more everything that you've given me. Love, Bill. Okay, so now it's August 24th. It's 11 days after my birth. My mom and her mom are at our home in Rancho Bernardo, and they're about ready to go to the airport to pick up my aunt. She's coming to California for the first time to meet me. There's a knock at the front door. My mom answers the front door, and instantly her world implodes. Because standing in the doorway are two Navy officers and two wives of the commanding officers of my father's squadron and they don't have to say anything because instantly she knows that her friend from junior high school who became her sweetheart in high school, who became her fiance in college, who became her husband, will not be returning home. And she also knows that I will never have the opportunity to meet my father. So let me explain to you what happened on that day. My father was in his aircraft, the F-4 Phantom, about ready to take off on the aircraft carrier. He's heading down the flight deck, and the left rear tire explodes. And this is a problem because there's only three tires on this plane. So it not only slows the plane down, but it also sends it off the edge of the flight deck at a strange angle. Well, this instantly flips the plane, and now it's on a collision course with the ocean below. My father had the foresight to pull the ejection lever, which sent the backseat pilot straight into the ocean, and he was later saved. And then the plane impacted the ocean before my father's ejection seat was able to ignite. After an exhaustive search, both the airplane and my father's body were never recovered. 
He was just 26. Now, as my mom says, you don't really get over a tragedy like this. I'm sure many of you have experienced tragedies, and you know, but you do learn to continue living. And one of the ways she was able to do that is she had a lot of support from fellow Navy wives as well as fellow Navy officers, one of which was another pilot named Tom. Now, Tom would come around and check in on my mom and also play with me. And as the story goes, first Tom fell for me. I mean, can you blame him? And then he fell for my mom. They started dating, they were married, and in April of 1971, my sister Susie LaCours was born. So, ultimately, um, Tom, <laughs> there's a phone call. Uh, Tom LaCours adopted me, and today I am David LaCours. So I think from this photo you can tell that I was a pretty well-adjusted kid. <clears throat> but I did have some internal emotional conflict over losing one father and, and gaining a new dad. And I gained some resolution about this particular issue uh, just recently, when we found an old reel-to-reel -reel tape that my father had made as an audio letter that he sent home to his parents. We took that tape to a lab and had it converted to a CD, and I had the opportunity to listen to my father's voice for the first time. And I heard him tell a story. I heard him explain something that was going on, and I had this epiphany that, of course, I share the biology of this amazing man, Bill Heap. He gave me my voice. And Tom LaCours, the man who raised me, well, he gave me the confidence to use that voice. So these are my grandparents, the Heaps, who, you know, it was a very difficult decision for my parents whether or not to have my name changed, because at first it was Heap, and this was the legacy of, and so they had to decide if they were going to change my name, because they wanted to honor the legacy of my grandparents, but they also realized that we were this new family unit, and they didn't want me to have to explain that I had this new last name every time somebody met me and said, why is your name Heap and the rest of your family is named LaCours? Okay, so that's my story. Now we're going to move on to the second half, and we're going to take a look at how does story connect? How does it work? And so what I want to share with you, but before we do that, I, I need to sort of pay homage to where I got most of my research. Because I heard once that if you borrow from one source, it's plagiarism. But if you borrow from many sources, it's research. Exactly. <clears throat> okay, so how does story connect? Story allows us in. Let me tell you what I observed of you all as the audience once I started telling my story. A lot of you relaxed back into your seats. Your jaws become a little more slack. Your eyes open up. Now, I couldn't see this, but there's a good chance that your heartbeat started slowing and your blood pressure even lowered. So story allows us in physically. It also allows us in mentally. Story has this ability to induce a form of trance where we become less analytical and more connected with the imagination and subconscious centers of our brain. And I think this partly comes from the conditioning of being told stories as children. And I certainly know that when I tell my nephew and niece a story, they're like little sponges absorbing every word. Now, this is presumptuous, but I'm going to assume that you're more open to hearing my message now because I first made myself vulnerable in telling you my story. Sometimes the truth of our message can be too cold to take in. If we're taking on big, heavy subjects, which we need to be, like global warming, poverty, homelessness, saving the sea turtles. Sometimes the truth of that can be overwhelming for our audience, and it brings up feelings of guilt or shame in them for not doing more. But when you clothe that story, sorry, when you clothe that truth in story, then people will open up their, the doors of their minds and allow you in. So story is like a Trojan horse. First, we're able to enter somebody's mind, so then we can reach their heart. So how does story 
allow us in? How does it connect? Story moves us emotionally. Story has this ability to inspire, engage, enchant, scare. And if you need further proof of this, just look at the movie industry. We like to be moved. In fact, when we're moved emotionally, we feel acknowledged. We feel like the person telling the story gets us. Human beings crave drama. I mean, so much so that if we're not getting it, we're really good at creating it in our own lives. And if you want to reach people, you can't just do it on an intellectual level. You've got to connect with them on an emotional level. So why is emotional connection so important? Because we buy and make big decisions based on emotion and later justify with fact. Let me give you an example. Think back to the last time you made a big purchase decision. Let's say it was to buy a house. Sure, you do a lot of research, but at the end of the day, you walk into what is your new home, and it just feels right. And then you justify and you say things like, well, it's in a great school district, the resale value was supposed to be good, and there's a great opportunity to do some landscaping. As a society, we are drowning in a sea of facts. So throw your audience the lifeline of a story to help make sense of all those facts. Facts are free, they're ubiquitous, and they're available as fast as you can type in Google. So as such, facts have become somewhat of a commodity, and they're not as valuable as they once were. Now, I think with statistics, we can all agree that you can torture numbers long enough, and they will confess to just about anything. But when you weave story in with those statistics, then you can deliver that message with an incredibly powerful impact. Let me give you an example of this. When I tell you there were 58,000 American servicemen killed in the Vietnam conflict, that number, 58,000, is tough to get our arms around. But when you see a visual story, like the one that Maya Lin told when she designed the Vietnam War Memorial, and you've got this sea of names that appears to stretch almost to infinity, well, I can tell you from personal experience of seeing my father's name, that is delivered in an emotionally powerful way. We like to be moved. When we're moved, we feel acknowledged and we feel like the person who's telling the story gets us and there's a connection that ends up being made. So story has this ability to move us from getting to know, to like, to trusting us or our organization. And once we have that trust, then we can use story to model the behavior that we seek. So how does story connect? Story models behavior. If we want people to change, that means we want them to adopt some sort of new vision. And story is perfect for this because it provides simulation, how to act, as well as inspiration, motivation to act. So when you were hearing the Gandhi story earlier, hopefully there's a good chance that you were thinking, well, what are some of the ways that I can model behavior that I seek. And so what happens is that you as an audience form this connection to the protagonist. And then you start to think, and this is why story is really incredible, is because you start to fill in the blanks and use your own thought process for how you're going to get that done. So story encourages participation. There's some fascinating things happening these days in neuroscience in relation to story. When we wire somebody's brain, and tell them a story and look at it on a monitor, the exact same areas of somebody's brain light up as if they're actually experiencing the story that they're hearing about. So this is good. So story becomes like a flight simulator for the brain. And the reason this is terrific is because we don't typically have formal authority over those that we want to adopt our vision. We don't, they're not our employee, they don't report to us. So story can serve as almost like mental software. And somebody's going out through their regular day, and then they have an opportunity to hopefully adopt or make a decision that we're hoping to influence. And then that story will replay and make a positive influence uh, upon them and affect the outcome. So let me circle back. I told you before I shared this story that, of how I became David LaCours. So this is how you spell my last name. And the root of this last name is C-O-U-R, which if you took high school Latin, you might remember means the heart. This is also the same root of the word courage. And courage today is pretty much used as a synonym with bravery, but that wasn't always the case. When courage was first into, introduced into our language, it meant this, to tell your story of who you are with your whole heart. Well, fellow Tedsters, that's what I've done today, and that's what I encourage you to do 
every time you tell your story.